Hello everyone, I'm Jin Chao from UCUI Society. I'm the machine learning officer for this year. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to give you this very small lecture about the building blocks of machine learning. Uh, we will see three topics in this lecture. First of all, we will see the topic of optimization. So optimization is a very important step uh, or the techniques that we will use to train our model. In particular, we will say one technique called uh, gradient descent. That is uh, a crucial technique that we use uh, in, in many training process. Uh, you will see it again when we move to the neural network training part later on, um, because it's, uh, it can save many uh, computation resources and that is very important. So, um, but in this part, I just want to give you intuitive uh, thinking about that. Okay. Uh, then we will move to the advanced linear algebra. We will see some basic properties of metrics. And in the third part, uh, we will see what is kernels. Kernel trick is a very important uh, technique, uh, very crucial uh, when we do uh, classification or to deal with uh, practical problems in, in, in our real life. Uh, because, you know, most of the classif classifiers are non are linear classifier. But in fact, the problems are always nonlinear. So how do we deal with this kind of nonlinear problem? We use the kernel tricks. It's proved very successful uh, in support of vector machine. And we will see it later on. Okay, so for the first part, you can see, uh, we will introduce you some uh, uh, thing, thing about the optimization. So uh, let's recall your memory about linear regression. I believe most of you might have uh, have heard or have seen or have learned about linear regression through many resources, including our notebooks. Um, so one the initial problem that you may have is how do we evaluate if a linear regression model fits the best or fits a given data data well. So um, one intuitive thinking is that we use a sum of distance between true value and the predicted values to see if a model is good or not, right? So for example, on the right, you can see the two pictures. The first model is well-fitted because the distance between the true values and the predicted values are very small. I mean, the sum are very small, um, smaller than the second one. So this is a badly fitted uh, model here because uh, the distance here, you can see it's very large. It's larger than this. Right, so it's treated as a badly fitted model. Okay, so we also call the, dis the sum of the distance uh, as a loss function, as you can see here, right? In fact, this this, this part it should be the y hat, right? This is what we predict, okay? So um, then the question becomes, we want to obtain the best regression and uh, we need to minimal, mi minimize the d, the sum of the distance, right? That is to find the best parameter beta star. Okay, so then the problem comes to how to find the best parameter beta star, which can minimize the loss function, d, right? Uh, one, one of the possible solutions is to use derivative. We want to find the beta that can lead to the partial derivative of loss to loss function to the beta x to zero, then that beta should be the beta star, which is the best parameter uh, that minimizes the loss function. However, uh, sometimes we cannot find a closed form of derivative. For example, if we use logistic regression and if we want to find the derivative, it's impossible because the derivative of the loss function of uh, uh, of the, the logistic regression is uh, has no closed form. So in this uh, case, we want to use another method to deal with it. Monte Carlo method is option. Uh, how it works? Just like uh, let's look the graph here. Okay. On um, the the x-axis is uh, actually the y hat. You can also treat it as a beta, the parameter, right? because the y hat is a function of beta. So you can think 
all the value here. That is, we choose different value of beta and to see how the loss function perform. And in this case, we want to minimize the loss function. So we will select a beta which can uh, which have the minimum value of loss function that is treated as the best point and the best parameter beta. That is actually the beta star. Okay. Um, but if we take 100 points here, that is a uh, very computation uh, consumed. Okay. Um, let me clarify that. Some of you may have question. Why zoning one 100 times of uh, computations and we have the best parameters. That's very, that's a good deal, right? But in fact, that is only one parameter here. If we have 25 parameters, for example, let's have a quick calculation here. For 25 parameter AMN, artificial neural network, if we should test 100 points for each parameters, um, how many times um, of computation needed? The fact is that we might need 100, sorry, we may need 100 to power of 25 times of computation. But in fact, one of the best uh, supercomputer in the world, Tianhe number one, it can compute 10 to power of 15 per second, times per second. And you can calculate how much time if we use this computer to calculate a, such a simple AMN model. Mm. It's, it's impossible, in fact, to calculate it until, until the end of the world. We cannot compute the best parameters using this kind of method. So we have another alternative. We have a more sophisticated approximation by using gradient descent. Okay, To find the best parameter, we can just arbitrarily initialize a set of parameters. Uh, you can, for example, here, like uh, the point on the curve, and then we calculate its, its, its gradient. You know, the gradient should be on this direction. However, if we move the parameters on the, on the, on the negative direction, on the opposite direction of the gradient, we can approximate gradually to the optimum, right? Okay, so let me put it in a more formal way. So to find the uh, best parameter beta, which can minimize the loss function, we will arbitrarily set the initial parameter beta one. And then we will compute, compute the gradient at this point. Okay, this is loss function gradient of loss sum function of beta one here. And the y axis should be loss function, okay? That should be beta. And after that, we, you, we update the beta two equals to beta one minus this term that is given here. By the way, also, a coefficient alpha here. That actually is a learning rate. Just thinking about it, if we set a very large learning rate, then the step will be very large. That means um, every step we go is very big, right? If we set a very small alpha, the step should be very small. So uh, a larger uh, uh, learning rate means the logarithm converges faster. Otherwise, it converges slowly, right? And we will repeat these two steps until the logarithm converges, okay? However, if we simply use the gradient descent by all the data, uh, by all the data points in your data set, that would be impossible. Why impossible again? Because it consumes your memory um, highly. Even, even exceed the, 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 your memory, okay? Because 
just thinking about if we have uh, 10,000 points data, uh, data points, and we calculate every gradient for each data points, and we store them in the memory until we finish all the calculations and, 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 and we integrate the value together and update the parameter beta. That would be, would be impossible because there are many uh, intermediate variables here that should be stored in memory. So that is very memory consumed. So as an alternative, we can use bench gradient descent. That means we split the data, the data set into segment segmentations. And we train the model or the, we update the parameter bench by bench. Every time we only use some a part of the whole data to train our model. Sorry, to train our model and update the parameter. That is more feasible. Okay, but in fact, you can see here mini bench gradient descent never actually converges. The graph here shows uh, for gradient descent, the convergence line is very smooth, and we finally get the optimal point here because we use all the data here. However, if you use uh, the mini bench gradient descent, that, mean, that means the convergence process is not stable. Because we randomly choose the data, it may have, uh, it may have some bias. Um, uh, the loss function value may be rise down, rise down, rise down, rise down, like this. But finally, it will work around the maximum. That means it never actually converges because we only use a bunch of data here, not all of them. Okay, so <clears throat> when bench size in particular x to one, it becomes uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, famous technique called stochastic gradient descent. You might heard or seen it before. Okay, so let's move to the second part uh, about the linear algebra. I will introduce you with the properties of matrix, some of them, uh, very briefly. Okay, because it's uh, a little bit boring. So for the eigenvalues and eigenvector, we define the eigenvalue and eigenvectors by this formula. That is a matrix times a product, a vector, if it pro, uh, equals to a number times that vector, that a number should be the eigenvalue, and a vector should be the eigenvector. Okay? So for a matrix, for a square matrix, uh, in the n times n space, it should have n eigenvalues, okay? Um, you might see it, uh, uh, see it soon in the PCA part of the notebook uh, released this week, okay? And this is one of the most important property of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvector. So I just don't want to skip uh, this part. And then we introduce you about the rank of metrics. What is the rank of metrics? For uh, uh, for 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 non-zero eigen, uh, uh, that is actually the number of non-zero eigenvectors. That is called the rank of a matrix. Okay. So in particular, for 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 uh, for a matrix contains only zero, um, the rank of that should be zero as well because uh, the eigenvalues are all zero here, okay? Uh, but for full rank, we define it like this. Uh, uh, the rank should be equal to the number of column, okay? And it has a property that the rank of it itself equals to the rank of its uh, transpose, like this, okay? And also the determinates, what it determinates? That is uh, actually the series product of eigenvalues, you can see here. Okay. The determinant of A should be the series product of eigenvalues. So that can be used to judge if a matrix is a vertical or vertical. Okay. So if a matrix is square and has no zero determinant, that uh, matrix should be invertible. Okay, 
Okay, so let's move to one of the most important part of this lecture, that is a kernel tricks. Um, that is very useful in many nonlinear problems to deal with such a kind of problems. So uh, we will see it, how it works and uh, why we use it, okay? So before we introduce the kernel, we should know what is a feature map. Actually, feature map is a transformation of the input data set. For example, uh, given a data set X has two dimension, X1, X2, uh, in the 2D space, right? We can map it into 3D space by the feature map function like this. That means uh, for the original data, we have only two dimension, x1 and x2. After transformation using feature map, we have three access or three, uh, three uh, dimension. The first dimension is given by x1 square, and uh, the second is x2 square, the third one is x1 times x2. So that means we um, increase the dimension of the data, and that makes the data uh, more sparse, okay? So let's see this example. Um, for the data points in the 2D space, it's very hard for us to use a linear classifier to separate them uh, from each other. Uh, because you can say the bound between the two kinds of data are nonlinear. However, it's very hard to train or to construct a nonlinear classifier, in fact. So we have to do some transformation from uh, to, to, to transform the data from 2D space to 3D space. Okay, so in this case, we use a transformation, for example, like this, to transform the data from the 2D to 3D. That makes the data more sparse, um, separate from each other um, compared to the 2D. And in this case, we can use a hyperplan, which is linear, to separate the two classes of data. Okay? So the kernel, finally, we can move to that. that uh, the kernel is defined as the inner dot product of feature maps that is given like this. Okay? So that means if we know the kernel, because, because the kernel is the inner product of that, so if we know the kernel, we might not need to know the feature maps anymore. Because sometimes you can see later on, the feature maps can have infinite terms or many terms or uh, implicit uh, expression that we cannot know. In, in, uh, um, in fact, if we know the kernel, we don't have to know the feature map. The kernel implicitly contains the transformation of the feature map. So let's see how it works. For example, the first example is a polynomial kernel. Okay, the kernel function is given is given by this. Okay, so assume we have uh, uh, two points x and y. We can say the transformation by using the kernel becomes like this. Let's say what information it, con it, it contains or it has, okay? So according to the definition of kernel, it should be the inner product of the, of the uh, feature map, right? We try to assume the feature map of uh, X should be like this. And we'll verify by using this to obtain the inner product of that. We can see the formula of these two are exactly the same. Okay, so that means we map the uh, data x from a 2D dimension space with axis x1, xx2 to the 3D with this three axis um, by using this kernel function, okay? So that is more intuitive. That's why we only need a kernel, okay? However, if we want to find, or always find the feature map like this, it's impossible. For example, if we have a Gaussian kernel like this, it seems the kernel function is very simple. 
But however, um, the feature map of that has infinite term. Okay, this is because we can see here um, we use Tyler Ceres to expand the kernel function like this. And in fact, it contains infinity term in this. It's uh, uh, with infinity terms of polynomial. And uh, you can see in the, in the formal example, uh, the polynomial uh, can be expanded. Uh, uh, the feature map of, uh, of polynomial kernel should be like this. So if we have infinity terms, it's, it's impossible to find the feature maps. But we can express the kernel function in, the, in a very simple form, like this. OK? So in fact, kernel, in, in fact, the Gaussian kernel is very useful. That implies we can uh, map a low dimensional data to a very high dimension space, which can be infinity. Okay, so that is uh, that that contributes uh, to the success of the uh, support vector machine, because the su support vector machine uh, re it depends on how sparse the data is, and we always use uh, the Gaussian kernel to separate data in a very sparse space. And then we can use just a linear hyperplan to separate uh, two kinds of, uh, uh, two class of data. So Gaussian kernel is uh, is uh, one of the most popular and, uh, and useful that you have to know. When you apply the, 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 the uh, support vector machine, you have to try to use Gaussian kernel instead of linear kernel or sigmoid kernel or polynomial kernel, okay? So that's all of our today's lecture. I hope you to enjoy uh, the coming um, live session too, and also the notebook that we have released. And uh, any question about this lecture and notebooks and the tutorials are welcome. Uh, please let us know. Thank you 